Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Kentucky Book Fair, Kentucky <laughs> Historical Society jointly sponsored, uh, we'll call it symposium for lack of a better word, uh, uh, program today on Appalachian writing. Everything old is new again. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Karen Salyer McElmurray. Can I yes. mangle it there? Ms. McElmurray is with us today at the book fair with her new book, Walk Till the Dogs Get Mean, Meditations on the Forbidden from Contemporary Appalachia, which features essays from today's finest established and emerging writers with roots in Appalachia. She's also the author of Surrendered Child, which is about the relinquishment of a son to adoption in the state of Kentucky in 1973. She's also the author of Motel of the Stars, She's currently finishing her eighth draft of a novel entitled Finishing Inez and also working on a collection of lyric essays called The Land Between. Ms. McElmurray is teaching full-time writing at Gettysburg College and lives part-time on a farm outside of the Gettysburg area. Thank you very much. Please welcome Ms. McElmurray. Well, hello, everybody. Oh, we. Oui. <laughs> I'm uh, really uh, excited to be here today. Um, I always start like doing a reading or a class. I'm very deep, you know, personal in what I say. I was just thinking about how last night I was in the airport until, I guess, 1230, something like that. And around 10, we were changing planes. And it was at that point that I heard about all this stuff in Paris. I've you know, been following the events. And I just have ever since felt so discombobulated. And then here you are at a, at a writing festival. Uh, and that is there in my psyche. So I'm just particularly glad to be here because of that. It makes me feel really grounded. It makes me feel just so happy to be here to have a chance to introduce these three wonderful, wonderful white writers. Um, Chris um, Scott and David Joy and Robert Guy. And I was hoping that they would each read for us a little bit. I'll introduce, um, I'm gonna just in alphabetical order, is that okay for you guys? And I'd like to hear you each read a little bit. I guess that you've read the description of this panel, which promises to be, uh, let me find that again. Um, Appalachian writing, everything old is new again. That's how I kind of feel today doing this, this panel. I felt wiped out and old, and this is renewing me um, with the events of the world going on. So our first reader today will be, if we do the alphabetical thing, Chris Scott. He is the author of the best-selling debut novel, The Secret Wisdom of the Earth, selected as the number one indie next pick by the American Booksellers Association. Novel also chosen as an Amazon featured debut, an Amazon Best Book of the Month, an editor's pick by the Chicago Tribune, an editor's choice by the New York Times, and a new and noteworthy book by USA Today. The novel, called a powerful epic of people and place, loss and love, reconciliation and redemption by Kirkus Reviews, is set in a small town deep in the Appalachian coal fields. Scotton has been a carpenter, an amusement park ride operator, a kite flyer, a bouncer, a tennis racket stringer, and CEO of a few technology companies. So Chris, will you read some for us? Sure. <laughs> but by far the best job I've had is that kite flying job. If you can ever get paid for flying kites, I highly recommend it. It was, uh, it was. So I was, uh, I was working at, uh, at, a, uh, at the beach in uh, Maryland, and there was a kite store, and they needed someone to, to fly the kites on the beach to get all the people down into the store, and they hired me and were paying me, at that point, $4 an hour to fly kites, which was a fortune back then. That was a long time ago. But these, these were big, big 20-foot, kites that required a strong college kid to do it. So if someone says you go fly a kite, then you have a whole new... I would require them to pay me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, uh, so this is, uh, this is my, uh, my debut novel. In fact, we, we're all debut novelists. So this could easily be a debut novelist panel uh, as well. Uh, it's called The Secret Wisdom of the Earth. Has anyone had a chance to read it yet? Uh, oh, there's one right there. Uh, there you go. So. Uh, 
uh, it, it did get, it got great reviews when it, when it first came out. Um, yeah, and like all first time writers, I'm sure you guys did the same thing. You know, I went online to see right, what, are, what are the reviewers saying about it? You know, are they saying good things or bad things? Because a bad review to any writer is like a spear in the heart, you know. But if, for a debut writer, you know, it's even worse. So I went online and there was all kinds of good stuff, you know, New York Times. David Woodrell gave it a great review in New York Times. He's one of my favorite, favorite writers. But there was one, there was one review um, that a woman posted online, and she said, and it was kind of probably the most poignant review I could have imagined. She, uh, she said, oh, I love the characters, and I love, you know, I love the story and the relationship between Pops and Kevin, the narrator, is just so, so beautiful. But I don't understand why they put bacon on the cover. <laughs> And, and like I said, like, what, bacon on the cover? What are you talking about? I look, I said, oh my gosh, it is bacon. <laughs> and now I can't look at the cover without seeing the bacon, you know, and I, uh, it's true. If you Google, you know, bacon, secret wisdom of the earth, it'll come up, but. Uh, uh, I, well, I, I don't think that's bacon, but it's definitely it's bacon down there. It's even like, a, it's not scratch and sniff, but anyway. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, so the story, uh, it's, it's narrated by a 40-year-old man who's looking back on the seminal summer of his, of his 14th year. And uh, he's, he lives in uh, Indiana uh, with his parents, and he, uh, he, he accidentally causes the death of his younger brother in this horrific, horrific accident at home. Uh, absolutely, it's just this awful, awful uh, accident. And he and his mom witnesses it. It happens on their front, their front yard. And so he and his mom go to live with her father, his grandfather, in an old coal mining town in eastern Kentucky uh, called Megger, Kentucky. And uh, it's there that uh, Kevin, the narrator, falls in with this half-wild kid uh, from a hollow named Buzzy Fink. And Buzzy is kind of this uh, amalgamation of every you know, literary near-do-well, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, and Artful Dodger uh, all wrapped up into one. And he's the coolest kid in town, and Kevin's very much of a nerd like I was growing up. And Buzzy takes him under, under his wing and, and uh, helps him kind of begin to heal. Um, and the town itself is beset by this mountaintop removal operation that's just destroying uh, the, the natural beauty of the place. And um, there's one man in town who is opposing the mountaintop removal, a guy named Paul Pierce. Uh, there's one catch, uh, he happens to be gay. And um, everyone in town knows that he's gay. Um, he's, he and his partner are politely known as bachelor gentlemen uh, in town. Um, and, but it's the, town's, it's the town's secret. And at a town meeting, when he uh, tries to rally the citizens against the, the coal mining, he's outed. And then a week later, he is beaten to death. And the beating is witnessed by Buzzy Fink, the narrator's friend. And so Buzzy knows who did it, uh, but he can't say for his own reasons. And that, that hate crime propels the rest of the novel to a, a thrilling conclusion. My, my reader, uh, thrilling, thrilling conclusion. Uh, so, uh, so what I'd like to read uh, is um, just a, a quick chapter, if I could. Um, this one is, um, so uh, Pops, the grandfather, is, is a large animal veterinarian. And the way that the reader is introduced to the characters in the novel, Pops takes uh, Kevin on calls around county, around the county meeting all the various characters and, and so forth. So in this, in this particular passage, um, we meet uh, Pops, obviously, Kevin, and Grubby Mitchell, who is the owner of the farm right below the mountaintop removal operation. So, so this one is called uh, Bull Testicles. Now, um, as m many of you know from your bull castration experience, uh, castrating bulls uh, is, is generally best done when they're about two weeks old. These are yearling bulls that they have to castrate and dehorn, which is a chancy business, uh, to say the least. So, I followed Pops out to the shed where he kept his veterinary supplies. The outside of the structure was weathered gray wood topped with a, with a corrugated tin ceiling and a weather vane stuck on west. Inside was immaculate and organized with row upon row of polished wooden drawers, brass knobbed and wearing unrecognizable names. Amitraz, Bacitracin, Clinomycin, Dextamethasone. The ceiling was stocked with gleaming metal veterinary accessories, several sizes of forceps, polished spreader bars, Clippers, clamps, shears, syringe guns, all dangling from overhead racks the way a chef hangs pots and pans. He loaded his satchel with several accessories, latched it, and locked the shed. 
In the kitchen, he poured us each another cup of coffee and travel mugs. Mine read, Bacitracin for ulcerative postitis, Merck Animal Health. What's ulcerative postitis, I asked. I figured any additional knowledge would serve me well as a junior veterinarian. Pops laughed, something you don't want to get. What is it? Pizzle rot. Pizzle rot? It's a nasty fungus that affects ram penises. A ram with pizzle rot is an, un is an unhappy ram, let me tell you. For that matter, a man with pizzle rot is pretty unhappy too. We can catch pizzle rot? We can, but not from sheep. And I, and I want to apologize in advance for my southern accent. <laughs> I'm, I'm from the north, so, you know. Um, he, uh, he put the satchel in the back of his truck, uh, and I slid into the passenger side bench seat. He reversed out the chisel, took a ride on Watford. We headed through the west side of town to Route 17, passing storefronts abandoned like October corn stalks, X's taped across windows, a deserted gas station on the corner, naked islands stripped of pump hardware, weeds breeding in the pavement fissures, a still open liquor store. We came to the, to the intersection of Route 17 and 32. A four-story structure sat abandoned on a cut-in in the corner, small windows frosted over, some boarded, some broken. 10-foot chain link with concertina wire on top. What's this old building? This used to be the plant for Lux Industries, a chemical company that employed everyone in town who wasn't a miner. They made urinal mints, splash guards, and other things for public toilets. What are urinal mints? You know, those little round perfumey things in the bottom of urinals? Why do they call them mints? They don't taste like mint, do they? Well, Kevin, I never actually tried one, but I imagine they don't taste like mint. Anyway. The Megger plant was one of the leading producers of urinal mints in the entire country. Just about every urinal mint east of Mississippi and south of Maryland came from Megger. I thought about all those men holding their penises and staring down at a urinal mint from Megger, tearing the rinds off cigarette butts with their piss streams. Lux Industries, Megger, Kentucky, emblazoned on the splash guard. It made me proud. <laughs> what happened to it? They moved production to Mexico and closed it the same year all the mines shut. He looked over at me. It wasn't a good year for us. We took, we took a right on 17 and followed the edge of the valley floor. The Mitchell Farm occupied a prime funnel-shaped valley between two rolling hills of Rag Mountain that eased out of her like inviting legs. Next to Rag was the flat gray wound from the strip mine operation running across three stubbed hills and hollows. We dusted up the dirt road, past a company of steer enjoying a morning cud, to the barns and pens and the slight incline of the lane, which signaled the business end of the farm. Grubby Mitchell was standing with Patesel Meadows in the barn door, examining the carburetor they had just pulled from his deep red Massey Ferguson tractor when we rattled up to the barnyard. Morning, Grub, Patesel, Pop said as he eased himself down from the worn out front seat and reached into the back for his brown veterinary satchel. Morning, they returned, staying fixed on the suspect carburetor. I exited on the other side and followed Pops close behind. Grubby, this is my grandson, Kevin. They looked up from the engine piece. Heard you was living in town now, pleased? Grubby said and nodded. Patesel smiled. Good to see you again, son. Engine's been leaning out, so I thought I'd have paid up to pull the carb and see. Well, that's sensible, Grub. While you're doing that, we'll have a look at those bulls. Where are they? Pen behind the pen barn. We walked to the back of the pen barn, which held two petulant bulls with proud horns and swaying testicles who looked as if they wouldn't relinquish them without a discussion. How are we gonna do these bulls without getting kicked? Getting kicked is the last thing we should worry about. Look at those horns. I leaned on the fence. Popped open the, oh, Pops opened the double doors of a large barn and began assembling a run of portable fencing from the pen gate to the barn. Pops, really, how are we gonna do this? I worried. Well, Kevin, I don't rightly know. I've never done it before. You've never done this before? Nope, that's why I asked you to come. Well, I've never done this before either. You know that. Well, we're just going to have to learn as we go, I guess. Do you want to hold the bull or do the cutting? I thought about my options for a moment. Uh, I, I guess I'll hold the bull. Anyway, so, so that's it. And uh, they castrate the bull successfully and then, and then leave. So I'll, I'll hand it off to one of these guys. <laughs>